Welcome to a virtual version of the Lord's Day service for May 12th, 2024. I'll start by reading a psalm, and our reading today is from Psalm 1. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the path that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers, but their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, which yield their fruit in its season, and their leaves do not wither. In all that they do, they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And then uh, another reading. This is from Matthew 7, uh, and a particularly difficult reading for some people. Uh, starting with verse 13. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction. And there are many who will take it. For the gate is narrow, and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few that find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but are inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorns or figs from thistles? In the same way, every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. The good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can the bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will, you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who does the will, do the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say, Lord, Lord. We did, not, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Go away from me. You have behaved lawlessly. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, Jesus said to Nicodemus in uh uh, John chapter 3, he said, God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. The world. Then he says in verse 17, he says, indeed, God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world that the world might be saved through him. Now, Jesus said to his disciples, I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. This is from uh, John chapter 17, which we will also read in the service. God loved the world, but his followers are, are of the, aren't of the world, and he is not of the world. Huh? What's all this talk about the world? This world stuff that we keep hearing about often. When you spend time with Christians, you mostly hear the world, almost like a curse word. But the word is actually cosmos in Greek. And it's not just world, but it's everything. It's everything you can touch and feel and see. Earth and sky. The physical universe is the cosmos. Cosmos is contrasted in Greek by the word uranos in scripture. Uranos is the heavens, which is the spiritual universe. So there's the physical universe and the spiritual universe. So this world, the cosmos, is it bad, corrupt, and decaying? Are the heavens all pure and good? Well, scripture isn't so clear about this. This duality that we have been saturated with, you know, that physical equals bad and spiritual equals good, comes from the Greeks and was then really souped up by the Catholic Church. 
But the weirdest thing in, about Christianity is that it is one of the most fleshy religions in the whole world, of, of anywhere. God is in the flesh in Jesus Christ, and Jesus prayed on earth as in heaven to bring the spiritual and physical worlds together. In scripture, cosmos is a neutral word. It doesn't have a good or a bad. It's beautiful when it's God's creation. And it's something that God, cosmos, loves so much. He loves the world so much. But it's also the place of corruption and evil. When Jesus says he's not of, of this world and that his followers are not of this world, what does he really mean? We get a little bit of a clue from John 17, 15, when he says, I am not asking you to take them out of the world, but I ask you to protect them from the evil one. In this verse, you can see that the world is a neutral word and that it's a place where evil is allowed to be. It's not that the world itself is evil, it's that evil is in the world. We all know this in our hearts, that the world is where good and evil play out. But Jesus is saying that this isn't all there is. There isn't only just the world, that we are also spiritual beings, that we can rise above the filth in spirit. But we can also, if we're, not too care if we're not careful, we can become disconnected and not enjoy the goodness of life if we are separated from the world. So you really have to have this interplay. We already know that this interplay between the physical world and the spiritual world already exists, and that there is good and evil in both. So why is this such a big stumbling block for Christians? We are told that we are to separate from the world, that uh, not the world, uh, not in the world, but not of the world, that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. And we can easily agree that we shouldn't be evil or do evil things, that we shouldn't encourage people to be evil or be selfish or corrupt, have corruption or be lying or cruel or any of these things. We should love good and we should be good. But does that mean we should escape and separate from the world? Psalm 1 seems to be pretty clear. Goodness provides happiness. That following the advice of the wicked, going on the path of sinners, and sitting in the seat of scoffers only leads to unhappiness and destruction. The wicked will perish, and that delighting in the law and loving God leads to goodness and happiness, and the good will prosper. Now, this is generally true, especially in the long term, when you look over the long term. But bad things do happen to good people. Prosperity gospel uh, is a lie because righteousness doesn't always lead to and it is not always rewarded with wealth, is, which is what the prosperity gospel teaches, that if you do good and you're really righteous, that you'll become wealthy. <laughs> but doing good things does improve your chances of prospering. And bad and wicked people, but bad and wicked people also often acquire lots of wealth and, and um, affluence and influence. And they seem to avoid accountability while they crush the weak and the poor. But we also know that true happiness doesn't accompany the evildoers. So be good, be kind, delight in the and love the Delight in the law and love the love God. These are this is super good advice, and advice that I often give people is just be good. You'll be happier. But for a lot of people, this isn't good enough. Uh, good works won't save you. That you can't earn your way to heaven. That only Jesus saves. They will say, and yeah, that's true. But. It's not an either-or like they portray it. Many people do good 
who don't give a hoot about heaven, who don't really know or even care about Jesus, will they be saved or not? This is a huge question without a simple answer. Sometimes the people who insist the hardest that this is a simple question are some of the meanest and least gracious people I know. I have uh, People that I've ever met are the ones that insist on this. Now, we read Matthew 7, 13 through 23 today, what I just read you. Like all scripture, it can be read many different ways. And for most people, when they read it, when they read it in isolation like I did, it looks very menacing. It has the narrow gate. The road is hard. Um, it has false prophets. It has wolves in sheep's clothing. It has bad trees not bearing good fruit. And it has those who cry, Lord, Lord, and Jesus will say, I never knew you. If you ever want to know whether somebody sees Jesus as gracious, loving, gentle, and kind, or they see Jesus as harsh, cruel, says it like it is, and judgmental, just ask them about what Matthew 7 means. Now, Matthew 7 is kind of a difficult passage, and it's difficult because it actually comes at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Now, most of us correctly believe that the Sermon on the Mount is at the heart of Jesus' message of mercy and justice and bringing the kingdom of heaven to earth. In chapter 5, you will hear the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes are, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek and the merciful, the pure in heart, the peacemakers. And you'll say, awesome, this is great, this is exactly what I thought the Sermon on the Mount was all about. Now, the word for blessed that you often hear here, here in here is um, actually a Greek word, and it's uh, makar oi, io, <laughs> sorry, oi, <oy-i. laughs> makar oi, sorry, and it means happy as well as blessed, and it means happy in the same way that Psalm 1 means happy. In fact, the CEB translation, and I'll show you it. This is one that I just love. Uh, it's a much easier reading version. It has a lot of great uh, uh, theology in it. But CEB translation says, Happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are those who mourn. Happy are the meek. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Happy are the merciful. Happy are the pure in heart. Happy are those who make peace. And further on, it even says, happy are those who are harassed because they are righteous. And happy are you when people insult you, speak bad and false things about you because of me. Be good no matter what, even if it's hard, because it brings ultimate happiness. But often you will see people who love the words of chapter 7 more than these words, and they ignore the words of the Beatitudes. This love of chapter 7 has a very particular reason, and it's widely misinterpreted. In fact, many pastors cry out, the narrow gate and the road is hard, as if Jesus wants us to fight our way into heaven, fight our way to the gate. They preach this because they want to create a culture of exclusion. They want to create a culture of insiders versus outsiders, the culture of saved versus the unsaved. The righteous Christians are against the evil world. Mostly, what they're trying to do when they use the, the, the scripture in this way is that they're trying to make Christianity into an exclusive club. Have you ever encountered that? Have you ever met Christians who talk about insiders and outsiders, saved and unsaved, as if you're in the club or you're out of the club? Well, if you haven't heard this, you're lucky because it's everywhere. 
but it's on the menu of fundamentalist churches everywhere. You hear it all the time from them. Whenever I encounter people who say this, I get Matthew 7 thrown at me a lot. These are some of the most memorized verses that are used as weapons in the whole Bible. So what are we supposed to do with these verses in chapter 7? This is why I love Amy Jill Levine so much. In our Bible study last year, we used her book on the Sermon on the Mount. And Lessons 35 and 36, if you want to look back, gave us the Old Testament grounding for these verses in Matthew 7. And the most helpful interpretive tool, I take what she said, and the most helpful interpretive tool that I learned in seminary to make sense of these. So let me tell you what this is. Whenever you approach a text, any text in Scripture, you should always ask, who is speaking? One. Who is the audience? Two. And what's the purpose of the narrative? Three. If you know this, you can get context for the verses that you're reading. For everything in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is speaking. The audience is uh, Galilean Jews who are likely fishermen and laborers. And third, the purpose is to oppose the legalistic, performative religion of the Pharisees and the scribes. Jesus is targeting these guys, not talking as much in general as we think. Everyone probably knew at this time, knew Psalm 1 by heart. And the Pharisees took this good advice, you know, about wicked and uh good people, and turned it into a weapon. They said, you need to follow the law to the letter. You need to be obedient. You need to be righteous in every way. That salvation comes only to the Jews and only through righteousness. That they could achieve special status. They could become insiders by following them. Now, Jesus' harsh language is a total rebuke of this exclusionary teaching. Jesus says the gate is narrow and the road is hard because these are the burdens that the Pharisees were laying on them. That if, you, without, if you're in the law, yeah, the easy way is to not follow the law. The hard way is to be strict in the law. When Jesus says false prophets are going to lead them, taking advantage of them, he's talking about Pharisees and other leaders. When he says, Lord, Lord, I prophesied and I cast out demons, but I don't know you. He's talking about these same people, these people who are laying heavy burdens on the people. He was talking about those who are making things hard, virtually impossible for the people. But what do you hear from many preachers today? You hear that the way of Jesus is the narrow gate. It's the hard road. You hear that false prophets are those who are open-minded and accepting and trying to make things easier for the marginalized people, for the poor, for LGBTQ people, for example. You hear that the ones who cry, Lord, Lord, are the faithless ones who aren't trying hard enough or doing the right things. Can you see that what they are preaching comes from the Pharisees' point of view? not Jesus' point of view. People who use Matthew 7 to exclude, to lay heavy burdens on people, who use them to enforce compliance to Christian ways, to push people out that they don't like, are the Pharisees of today. I'm afraid we're surrounded by them. So instead of seeing the world as the world is, which is a place of beauty, that, uh, yeah, it also has its problems, but it's also a place that God loves our world. When you see it that way, uh, instead of saying that the world is wholly evil, wholly corrupt, and totally hopeless, like that we often hear from preachers, that the world must be feared, that it's a curse word, 
that we must protect ourselves from the world, protect our children from the world, that we must create a pure Christian alternative society with our own music and our own books and our own everything, that we must create a Christian nation that won't accept anyone else, and that Jesus is their exclusive lion. Maybe he was a sheep before, but now he's a lion, and he's going to come at the end of the world, and he's going to smite our enemies. That's what you often hear. Don't fall for this. Don't fall for this exclusion and separation. It's often used to hide a culture of hate and shame. Really. Jesus will return to conquer evil, yes. He will make things right, yes. And he will fulfill the hope of a peaceable kingdom on earth. On earth as in heaven. That God of the spiritual realm, the Uranos, will come to us on earth, the cosmos, in flesh, in the person of Jesus Christ, that Jesus came to encourage us to replace the judgment of the Pharisees and others religious leaders with compassion and mercy to make the way easy and the gate wide that we can, for all of us, and that we can see the kingdom of heaven in him. So put away these old hateful ways to read scripture. Learn to see them with fresh eyes, with the freedom that Jesus gives us. Let us pray. Holy and gracious Lord, you are the God of light, the light of the whole world, which you love. Open our minds to see that Jesus opened the gates for us, not to lay heavy burdens on us. Help us to see that you didn't come to the world to condemn it, to divide it, and to make it into an exclusive club for only for the saved. Instead, for your invitation for happiness, for happiness of all, in the saving grace of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.